friends, welcome to Connector, your bilingual space. Today I'm ready to guide you through a journey all the way to the Middle East and the USA. Um, I have a new guest and I have a new topic. I hope you are comfortable in order to enjoy the show. We are going to be sharing important information. I want to remind you that you don't only see us through the Abby Ayala channel, but also through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. do you think that it is to take the time to understand your neighbor? If you would put that importance into a scale, let's say from 0 to 10, 0 being the least important and 10 being very important, what would it be? A 3? A 6? A 10? Well, based on my own experience, I would say that it is a 10. Always understanding others and taking the time to listen always gave me the chance to uh, reach a common ground or to solve a problem or to just uh, be able to not feel separated from the person that I'm having an issue with. So this can go, we can apply this thought in every different type of situation. You can uh, act like this with your family member, with your friends, or also we can go big and think about other societies, other cultures, and just people with other groups in the world. Today, we're gonna talk about activism as a way of understanding. Our guest is right now in Indiana, USA, and he's gonna tell us about his work and work and dedication in order to unify people along his way. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for staying connected. Um, as promised, I am already connected with Dr. John Andrew Mora. We're going to talk to him all the way from Indiana, USA. For the ones that are landing to the show just now, today we are talking about activism as a tool for understanding. Before we meet Dr. John, we are going, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his background. Dr. John Andrew was born in Montreal, Quebec. He was raised in a multilingual family. He lived in Montreal for 10 years and in the greater Toronto area for another 20. After completing his honors, BA, MA, and PhD at the University of Toronto, where he acquired expertise in Hispanic Native and Islamic studies, he pursued postgraduate studies in Arabic in Morocco and the United States. Besides his Western education, Dr. Morrow has completed the full cycle of traditional Islamic seminary. Aside from his academic duties, Dr. John is the director of the Covenants Foundation, an organization dedicated to disseminating traditional, civilizational Islam, promoting Islamic unity, protecting persecuted Christians, and improving relations between Muslims and peoples with another beliefs. Uh, he travels the world very often promoting peace and justice. It is my pleasure to meet you today, Dr. Morrow. Welcome to Connected. After reviewing all the work that you have done, and I must say that you have a very active and impressive volume of work, your range of work is wide. We're talking about writing, researching, teaching, public speaking, speaking, and activism. And I don't want to leave it out. Also, you speak French, English, Spanish, and Arabic. Dr. Morrow, definitely I want to tell you thank you for your dedication and all the knowledge that you spread with your work. Let's start with the interview. Um, how did you incline to activism and to this type of conversation? Well, some of it is uh, genetic, I believe. Um, 
I was born in Canada into a, a Métis family. The Métis are one of the three Aboriginal groups in Canada. In Canada, we have the First Nations, also known as Indians, Amerindians, uh, you know, Native Canadians. We have the Inuit, who are known errone erroneously as Eskimos. And we have the Métis people, who are uh, a mixture uh, primarily of uh, French European ancestry and um, indigenous ancestry. So we are a mestizo people genetically, but culturally and linguistically, we are considered uh, indigenous people. So if you take my French side, my French Canadian side, while the French have uh, a long history of struggle in Canada, um, they were the first Europeans to settle there. Uh, they came to terms with the indigenous population. Um, many of them intermarried with uh, native women, and at least the Métis people adopted indigenous culture. Later, the, the, the French in Canada were conquered by the British, um, and the French Canadians suffered as a result, as a result of discrimination, um, attempts were made to suppress their Catholic faith. Uh, attempts were made to ban their language. And so the French Canadians have a very, very long history of, of struggling to defend uh, their identity and their rights uh, and their language. On the other hand, my ancestors are indigenous people. And as we know, the indigenous people of the Americas have been struggling for over 500 years. As um, against uh, European domi domination and uh, colonization, and so uh, I mean, today I am wearing a uh, a Métis hat, which has a Métis sash, right? This sash right here, which is often worn uh, around the waist, around the shoulders, and and these colors are richly symbolic. We have red, which is uh, which represents the blood of the Métis or the Michif Otipe Misiwak people that was shed mm -hmm. through the years while fighting for our rights. Blue represents the depth of our spirits, and green, the fertility of a great nation. White uh, is for our connection to the earth and our creator, uh, the great spirits, Manitou. Yellow is for the prospect of uh, prosperity, and black is for the dark period of the suppression and dispossession of Métis land in Canada. And so genetically, culturally, I come from a long line of, uh, of people who have struggled uh, for justice. So there's that component. Right. There's also the religious component. Um, I am a person of faith and uh, my faith dictates that I should always stand on the side of the weak and the downtrodden and the, the dispossessed. Um, and stand by them. I'm, I'm a person who, who hates injustice and who hates oppression and who feels the suffering of other people. Um, and so, yes, as a result of a combination of uh, genes and, and culture and spirituality, I am what you would call a, a committed person. Right. And after hearing a little, uh, a lot, all the information you gave about history, I can see that we, we kind of have a lot of similarities and history here in South America as well. And I really appreciate you wearing that beautiful hat that you have and for explaining everything like the colors and everything to us. Uh, moving forward, tell us about your most recent article that is titled Islam Between Love and Hate. Yes, um, this is based on a presentation I gave last week. Uh, in Salt Lake City and the state of Utah and which I later published as uh, as an article on the Muslim post Islam between love and hate unfortunately as a result of um, the mass media and um, certain let's say mm, political motivation uh, Islam has been portrayed in a very negative light, um, disproportionately so. And so in this article, in this presentation, I wanted to give Islamophobic people 
uh, whether they're Jews or they're Christians, uh, essentially a taste of their own medicine. What the enemies of Islam typically do is they will take a verse of the Quran and quote it out of context. For example, they will cite something like, you know, kill them where you may find them. And then they, they say, ah, look, the Quran commands Muslims to kill people and to commit terrorism and so on. But that is not what the verse says. It is taken out of context, right? It's uh, kill them where you may find them, turn them out from where they have turned you out, for tumult and oppression are worse than slaughter. And so the Prophet and his companions in Mecca professed belief in one God and in social justice. And as a result, they were persecuted by the rich, wealthy, powerful polytheists. Um, eventually, they were forced to flee from the city of Mecca to the city of Medina. Nonetheless, they continued to attack them and to, to persecute them. They wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. They had stolen their homes and their possessions. They had tortured them. They had killed them. And they were nonviolent. They were defenseless, defenseless people. They were a minority in Mecca. And so they fled as refugees to Medina, where they settled, and they wanted to live in peace. So Medina was essentially a peace sanctuary. But yet, the pagan, as the polytheists, uh, these powerful people from Mecca, started to attack the Muslims during their caravans, and they sent armies to attack them. Um, and so Medina was under siege. And so that verse from the Quran was simply telling Muslims that they have the right to defend themselves from these people who were waging wars of aggression against them. And so, just in the same fashion that it is dishonest and duplicitous um, to take quotations from the Quran out of context, um, it, it is deceitful to do the same thing with the Bible. And so, in that presentation, in that article, I take certain problematic citations or verses from the Bible which uh, incite violence. Uh, and so, in the same way a person can use the Quran to try to demonstrate that Islam is a religion of hate and violence, a person can easily do the same thing with the Bible in order to prove that, you know, Christianity and Judaism are religions of hatred and violence. Now, obviously, I did this for a didactic purpose, for an educational <laughs> purpose, because I, as a Muslim, have the greatest respect for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As Muslims, we believe in Adam, we, we believe in Abraham, we believe in Moses, we believe in Jesus, and we believe uh, in the seal of the prophets, uh, Muhammad, uh, the son of Abdullah. And so, um, yes, what I did was to compare and to contrast verses from the Quran, uh, and verses right. from the Bible, uh, showcasing some of the more difficult passages, but also focusing on the passages that promote love and kindness and understanding and justice. So it was uh, an educational um, experience for, uh, for readers and for the audience. And that's exactly why I was so interested in interviewing you, because I really believe on the importance of listening to others. Whether you go with their beliefs or not, it's just, just the, the, the right of listening or the obligation that we should have in order just to uh, have a better experience on this life. Um, okay, so you did, your, you did your article about that, Islam between love and hate. Uh, if you could uh, briefly summarize the Bible and the Quran, uh, which differences and similarities would you point? Well, as a person who believes in building bridges, I acknowledge differences, but I try to emphasize similarity. Uh, 
because differences will not bring us together. It's what we share in common. And so if we compare these traditions, Christianity uh, and Islam, eh, we can throw in Judaism as well. We find that these three monotheistic religions uh, obviously all believe in one God. And so this is a, a point, a very important point, a central point that they all share um, in, uh, in common. These are all Abrahamic religions, religions that follow uh, in the footsteps of Patriarch Abraham, who was one of the first monotheists uh, to walk planet Earth. Um, there is, um, all of these religions believe in justice. Um, they believe in all of the prophets of God. They believe in the day of judgment. They believe in heaven and hell. Um, yes, so there is a great deal in common between the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran. And I would encourage Jewish people and Christian people to read the Quran. A great deal of the Quran is actually, you know, drawn uh, from the Bible. Okay, I'm not saying that it's copied from the Bible, but it's the same stories of the same prophets. Now, there are yeah. some small differences here and there. Um, but uh, overall, there's uh, there's a great deal in common uh, between these uh, these traditions. Right, and that would be that should be actually the value, right? Because the powerful messages that all these books have is that they all were written in order to bring us together, and it's a shame that nowadays it's happening happening exactly the opposite. Um, so, in your journey of activism and taking the message of uh, uni un being united and justice, do you have any story you could share with us? Yes. Well, in 2013, I published a book called The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the World. Um, typically, I, you know, I, I was a university professor and um, I would write books and I would publish them and then I would move on to the next book or to the next project. Um, when a colleague of mine got his hands on the book, uh, The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the World, he said that, you know what, this is not just a book. What we have here uh, is the basis of a movement. And this colleague of mine, his name is Charles Upton. And he's a famous uh, American poet, um, metaphysician, uh, perennialist, a very talented writer and a very um, lucid thinker. Um, mm -hmm. And so he conceived of, of what is known as the Covenants Initiative, um, which calls upon Muslims to abide by the treaties and the covenants that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, concluded with the Christian communities of his time. Um, and this became an international movement of Muslims oh. committed to protecting uh, Christians, persecuted Christians, but also the people uh, of the book as a whole. And, and uh, it expanded to, uh, to encompass uh, you know, the Yazidis who were being persecuted in Iraq, and of course the Shiite Muslims and the Sufi Muslims and the traditional Sunni Muslims who were all victims of these so-called radical Islamic terrorists or these Takfiri Wahhabis, uh, as we call them. And obviously I am referring to the group known as ISIS and uh, Nusra and uh, right. other affiliates. So it was just me and Charles Upton and we started this movement. And within a question of years, it spread like wildfire. The book became a great success. It was translated into Spanish. It was translated into Italian. And recently it was translated and published in Arabic. Uh, and then a smaller version of it was translated into dozens of different languages. This book attracted the attention. Uh, of Christian leaders, uh, Jewish leaders, and Muslim leaders. It attracted the attention of politicians throughout the world, 
And so I traveled to Europe and to the United Kingdom, and I met with diplomats and politicians and so on to discuss the importance of these documents in which the Prophet provides civil rights and human rights for the people under his rule. Uh, the rights that the Prophet gave to, uh, to the citizens of his ummah or his community uh, were unparalleled. These type of rights were only seen with the development of modern Western secular uh, societies. I refer to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the Bill of Rights, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So the Prophet was, well, without a doubt, a great visionary. And he, unfortunately, is, is presented by some Islamophobic people as, uh, as an oppressor and a persecutor, when in reality, he was a great liberator and uh, a giver of rights. And so I've ended up trying, yeah, yeah, I, I was invited to the White House by President Obama. Uh, yeah, I was, con I was, you know, Asked to advise, you know, the the Trump administration. Um, uh, I've been in contact with uh, His Holiness uh, Pope Francis, uh, with the Grand Muftis uh, in the Middle East, with royalty in the Middle East, with all kinds of leaders. So we are operating now at a very, very high level as advisors to world leaders, both political right. and religious. And so the thing is, I mean, you are what you do. We can sit around and do nothing. We can think that, oh, what is it going to change? It's not going to have an impact. But it was just me and Charles Upton. And the next thing you know, we're meeting with world leaders. I am going to the United Nations and I am advising, you know, you know, the, the president uh, uh, of Iran. So my message to people is that do not be apathetic. Do not feel helpless. Do not feel hopeless. You can do something. You can achieve something. And in the Quran, it says that if you save one human life, it is as if you saved all of humanity. And so don't worry about saving thousands and thousands of people, okay? Um, you should have very, you should think short term and then medium term and long term. Uh, if you help just another fellow human being, you will have done a great deal to help uh, humanity and uh, this planet. I can only imagine that this is just, it was started with a book, but the, the consequences and the results, even though it, hap it happened a lot of things, it's not over yet. And just the message that you are taking with it and spreading in the world, it's really uh, priceless because what would we do if we wouldn't have people like you and the people you work with that will make uh, put the, open the door for the type of conversation. Um, Dr. Uh, John, we're gonna go to a cut and we'll be right back. Stay at home, everybody. We'll be right back with the last question for Dr. John. Stay connected. Welcome back, connected people. And I'm still here with my uh, very impressive guest, uh, Dr. John Andrew Morrow. Um, I have the last question for him and I have to say, I would love to have more time to spend with you and to be able to listen to more of your achievements and to more of uh, your stories. But unfortunately, as always, we have to uh, kind of rush things up a little bit. Um, so Dr. Morrow, please tell me, um, from your point of view and everything you have seen um, and everything that has been happening on the Middle East, uh, what is your point of view on that matter? Well, I am deeply disturbed by what I see happening uh, in the Middle East specifically and in the Muslim world as a whole. Um, if we look at the situation in Iraq, um, we know that the imperialists lied about the situation in Iraq. They claimed falsely that there were weapons of mass destruction. They claimed falsely that Iraq was behind 9-11 when we know in fact that the group that was behind 9-11 was Al-Qaeda and that Al-Qaeda was 
supported, trained, and financed by the CIA to wage war against the Russians, uh, against the Soviet Union, and Afghanistan. So we know that the real reason that they attacked, invaded, and occupied Iraq, and in the process killed over one million civilians, all right? It's one thing to kill soldiers. According to the laws that govern warfare, this is permissible in a legitimate war. But when you kill one million civilians, women and children, this is despicable. Uh, and so they were after what? Oil. Ah, they were also interested in destabilizing and destroying uh, the Arab world and the Muslim world to prevent these countries from rising and becoming powerful. Can you imagine what would happen if the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Gulf Arabs uh, and the Saudis all came together with all of the oil wealth that they have? They would be a superpower that could rival any superpower. And so what they do is they divide and they conquer. They turn one country against another country. They turn Shias against Sunnis. They turn Muslims against Christians uh, in order to destabilize the region. And so Iraq was completely and totally destroyed. And the vacuum that created allowed for a group like ISIS uh, to, uh, to surface. What was the purpose of ISIS? Well, ultimately, it was to destroy uh, Syria, to over overthrow the government of Assad uh, you know, uh, and uh, annihilate a sovereign state. So um, Iraq was completely and totally devastated. And then, uh, you know, they turned their eyes on Syria in order to destroy that country. Always, what is behind all of these wars of aggression? Uh, natural resources, okay? So it is wealth. A great deal of money fortunes are made by warfare and also by the contracts that come with rebuilding nations iraq destroyed syria they attempted to destroy libya which was the, which was the wealthiest country in all of africa with a a, a long history of uh, of commitment to social and revolutionary causes was destroyed why was it because Gaddafi was a dictator no that wasn't the reason it was be because he had decided to no longer sell oil to europe and he was going to sell his oil to the chinese Huh? And then we have the scandalous case of Yemen, which is the poorest country on the planet, being devastated by one of the richest countries on the planet, Saudi Arabia, in what is in reality just a, uh, a practice run, a dry run, in order to prepare Saudi troops for potentially an eventual conflict with Iran. And so... It is very sad. Uh, it is very troubling uh, what is happening in uh, the Arab world, in the Middle East, in the Muslim world as a whole. And uh, sovereign nations and free people and people with a sense of humanity and decency must see things for what they are and not be deeped and de deceived by these globalist imperialists. <sighs> Just having the opportunity to listen to your point of view is priceless because we all know that we are exposed to different type of news and everything is being uh, manipulated. So I want to really thank you with all my heart uh, for giving the time to taking the time to give us this uh, priceless and, and such so rich information. Uh, thank you so much and um, just say a, a hi to Bolivia and if you'd like to invite people to visit and find out more on your website. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for, uh, for hosting me and uh, I send my greetings to the Bolivian people and to President Evo Morales. If you would like to learn and know more about Dr. Mora's work, Find him on his website. You can find the address here in our screen and over there you can even learn more about his works and his books and articles. We are at the end of the show and I want to leave you with one thought. The act of understanding others, it's a beautiful key that opens different dimensions 
dimensions of compassion, dimensions of love, dimensions of tolerance. So taking the time to research, to ask and to listen based off and it's worth it if we want to evolve as human beings. I will see you again in seven days. If you know anybody that is doing a great job for themselves or for the world, please let them know, write me. My email address is conectadosbolivia24 at gmail.com. I will see you in seven days. Goodbye.